So now we get to Roman religion. And I think it's going to be helpful as we go into Thessalonians particularly to understand something about Roman religion because it is the ever-present backdrop. Thessalonia, Thessalonica was uh, the capital of the Macedonian area. It was a major city. It's primarily a Gentile group of people. And these practices were very, very common. So first of all, uh, most cult practices of Roman religion were done by Romans in Rome. So by cult practices, I mean things like um, a sacrifice and prayer and ritual. Faith was not really a key constituent of Roman religion. It was much more about the look of things. And it was keeping the gods happy. If the gods were not happy, you would not be happy. My husband says, happy wife, happy life. So <laughs> I think the Romans would have said, happy gods, happy Romans. Okay. Now, there was also... This, this desire to placate the gods, that's why ritual was so important and they always prayed with ritual, but it wasn't about faith, it was ritual. Now, the imperial cult is not the same. The imperial cult is worship of the emperor as a god, and it was not done so much in Rome because they saw Caesar. Oh, there's, there goes Caesar on his chariot. God, he looks a little peaked today. But in the provinces where they had to keep control, it worked to Rome's advantage to say, oh no, Caesar's a god. He's, he's born a god. So Octavian starts out as the son of God. That was a title the Christians would take on for Jesus, but it's on the coinage that archaeologists find. The son of God was originally a Roman title for the emperor, and it was part of this imperial cult. So we're, it used to be that the emperors were not gods until they died, and then they suddenly became gods while they were alive. So that's a little bit um, of the background. Now, the Christians threatened the entire fabrication of Roman society. If God is not Caesar, but a God you can't see, and if the true king is the king of the kingdom of heaven, Christ Jesus, or God, who and Christ is his representative, then where does Caesar fit in? And that was a problem. And so the opposition that we're going to see in 1 Thessalonians is not from Jews, it's from the neighbor who says, if you don't pipe down about this Christian stuff, Rome is going to come in here with their chariots and burn us down. And that's exactly what Rome would have done, you know, when people acted out. So that's part of it. So the prayer to the emperor was very common. A prayer to God by Christians became very threatening. Everybody get that? Okay. There are two historical periods. I'm going to go kind of quickly. So uh, there are two historical periods prior to the Jews really coming into their own for independence. Um, they were always ruled by the Greeks or before that the Persians or before that the Babylonians. Finally, they have a period of independence from 166 to 63, a little over 100 years, and you all have heard of it as the Maccabean Revolt. It was a group of sons and their father who finally one day in a little rural area went, you know what, I am not obeying you, Mr. Roman soldier. And they killed the Roman guards there, and the Jews were ready to take off, and they actually threw off the Roman rule, and they had some independence. However, Caesar put an end to that, Julius Caesar, and in 63 they took over Israel again. Now, this, this is when Roman supremacy starts, and it goes all the way through the New Testament period to the first century. Pompey comes in and actually captures Jerusalem. I said Julius Caesar because he's really over the Roman army. Pompey was one of his generals. Okay, the Jerusalem temple. It would be hard to say or exaggerate how much it is ground zero for the Jews. It was built on the sacred property of the first temple built by Solomon, the son of David, back in 980 BCE. And when Herod the Great came in, he said, we're going to build on that footprint and expand it. 
four football fields long. It was a huge, enormous structure. And today, when you go to the Temple of the Mount in Israel, it is built, all of that, like the Western Wall, is part of this remaining temple. This is the temple that was primarily destroyed in 70. So this is the Roman Empire, 10,000 mile border from Spain all the way over to Asia Minor. And the Roman army kept track of that. Men who served in the army would often serve for 20 years. You might not have liked the movie The Gladiator, but it's a tremendously accurate portrait of what it was like to be a Roman soldier, especially those opening scenes. Um, our story is going to take place really in the First Thessalonians here in Thrace, which is Macedonia, Thrace area, and uh, then we'll also be studying Philippians in the same area. The New Testament was organized as a canon in the third century, the middle 300s. It was never in the order it was written. So what you have is a parallel to the Old Testament. You have four biographies that act somewhat like the Torah, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You have history books, which act like the prophets a little bit. One history book called the Book of Acts. You have letters, such as Paul wrote, similar to the writings, which are Psalms, Proverbs, um, Ecclesiastes. And then you have one apocalypse in the Old Testament, Daniel, which is in the New Testament. It's parallel as what, everyone? Revelation. The book of Revelation. So that is intentional. The people who put together the canon were originally Jews who became Christians, and later the Jews fell away by the third century, and it was primarily a group of Gentile Christians that put the canon together. But the order it was written is the order we're studying it this week. First Thessalonians is the first Christian document ever written. Paul had no idea when he was writing it. We would be studying it 21 centuries later. Think about that. How would you like one of your letters read and studied by people all over the world that many centuries later? So the letters, seven authenticated, written between 50 and 57 in the middle of the first century. Paul never met Jesus firsthand except on the Damascus Road after the resurrection. And he would claim he was the last appearance of, of Jesus as a post-resurrection appearance. Then you have the Gospels written, excuse me, the Gospels written between 65 and 90, starting with Mark, then Matthew, then Luke, and then the book of John written very late in the 90s. When you're reading the Gospels, you're doing spiritual archaeology. They're written about a period in the third decade through the lens of what's going on in the sixth, seventh, or eighth decade, and, and we apply them to our decade. So you're always reading on those three levels. Make sense? All right, then you have the pastoral epistles. By the time Timothy, Titus, Peter, and those are written, the church is underway. Their attitude about women, as an example, as church leaders, very common in Paul's day, very uncommon by the time the end of the first century is coming. They're trying to really mimic the Roman Empire, and women start to take a more subjugated role. And finally, you have the book of Revelation, which is about the triumph of good over evil. You have the apostles preaching the gospel. Was Jesus' life lived in vain? That is the question for every Christian to ask themselves. If the whole Christian story depended on you, would people know it? That's what the apostles' lives were like. They were not going to let his life be lived in vain. They were going to do everything they could, including very dangerous things to their own personal safety, to take that story forward. And the book of Acts is the book of the Holy Spirit directing them to do that. And I would argue that its ending, which is very kind of innocuous, it's as if it ended in the middle of a sentence, is because we write the ending with our lives. We are the Acts of the Apostles, still going forward. 
So that is the power of the living word of our New Testament. We have Paul clearly the, the star of the apostolic work to the Gentiles. Peter was the apostle to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. We'll talk much more about Paul as we go forward. This is the oldest cave painting known of Paul. It's from Ephesus. Um, it is a remarkable portrait that was done in the early 400s. And people lived there century after century, and they described what he was like, their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, and many people think this is a pretty accurate depiction of him. Long, aquiline, Roman nose, narrow, intense. Paul is not the kind of person that you'd sort of chat it up with. <laughs> he never lost his focus on what he was about. There were two groups always at work in the New Testament, the Jews and the Gentiles. Jews, you all know what that means. Gentiles is everybody else. doesn't matter if you're from Ethiopia, Rome, or, you know, today's Ukraine. If you were not born a Jew, you were other. You were Gentiles. So you have in the conversion area Gentiles who were pagan, and then you have Gentiles who are god fears who found their ways into synagogues and said, I really like what you all are talking about, this God you can't see more than the gods were worshiping and cutting open bulls and drinking their blood. And then you have Gentiles who became Christian after they heard Paul and, and others. And then you have those who are born Jewish that were in the synagogue. Some of them accepted the Christian story many of them did not, became some of Paul's severest critics. And that is primarily the letter to the Galatians. Are the people who were Jews who had converted to Christianity but insisted that you still must be circumcised and follow the law were constantly nipping at Paul's heels. And so that's an, another story.